Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Ant, I would ask you what's new and exciting in your world this week, but really, we're going to have to talk about what you did for the last week or so. I spent more than last week, it was the past two and a half weeks, started off in Portugal and walked 150 miles to Santiago in the northwest corner of Spain. It was 150 miles walking, 405,000 steps, and I burnt, according to my phone, 25,000 calories. And that last bit's a bit depressing. You would think walking 150 miles would give you something more than 25,000 calories. You stumbled across one of the immutable truths of weight loss and exercise. Weight loss happens when you cut your diet. It doesn't happen when you exercise more. Yeah. Surely you have something else that's interesting to talk about. Well, I do. And this stems from my visit to Portugal and Spain. As I'm dealing with a place in which people speak foreign languages, actually three over the course of my walk, Portuguese, Spanish, and Galician. And of course, I understand none of these things. So I'm dealing with all of these people who speak a different language than I speak. The mores are different. Discovered, for example, that the trick to getting food at a bar, I mean, you would figure that the trick to getting food at a bar is to, well, order food. Ask for it. Right. No, the trick to getting food at a bar is not to order food (laughs) because apparently- That doesn't seem right. Yeah, apparently this is a thing. Anytime you order a drink at a cafe, they bring you something. And by something, it could be anything ranging from some ornate sandwich thing with ham and cheese and all of that down to the one place we got, believe it or not, chicken nuggets or down to popcorn. It could be any sorts of thing. And the interesting thing is it's not consistent. I could be sitting at the same cafe as somebody 10 feet away. I order a drink. He orders a drink. I get ham and cheese sandwich, he gets a chicken nugget, or whatever it is. It's like there's a wheel in the back room that they spin, and whatever comes up, that's the thing you get. But this is just one example of the mores, the way that people act, and people understand that people act this way. All of that got me thinking about the question that you and I have phrased multiple times and which draws the ire of our listeners. That is, what do we owe each other? I'm realizing that I'm making it through Portugal, Spain as best I can, relying on the fact that I can at least understand some of the gestures and some of the words are similar and the mores, they're not exactly the same, but they're somewhat similar. And I'm looking at the people around me who do understand all of this and they can operate, they can interact much better. Now, stop and think about that for a moment. That common language, the common mores, all of that was inherited. You're born into a system and these things already exist. And it got me thinking again about what do we owe each other? Something as profound as your ability to interact with people around you, that is a gift that's granted to you as part of being a member of society. It seems to me that that implies some sort of owing on the other end. Now, I look forward to the hate mail that's coming, given what you just said. I've posed arguments like this to people before, and they've said things like, I didn't agree to any of that, which is absolutely correct. You didn't. Well, yeah, but that's like the argument that children make when they say, I didn't ask to be born. I mean, that's right, pumpkin. You didn't ask, but that's kind of irrelevant because here you are. Well, yeah, in, in the way I phrase it is, okay, you didn't agree to this, but If you were given the option, virtually everyone would take it. And so the fact that you didn't agree to it is irrelevant because you would have agreed to it had that been on the table. I don't even go that far. Here you are. It doesn't matter what you agreed to or didn't agree to because here you are and here the rest of us are. It's incumbent upon all of us to figure out how best to live together. You inherit this profound, I'll call it social infrastructure without which you simply can't interact with the people around you. But here's the weird thing. You've gone so far off your reservation that you've outflanked me. (laughs) How's that? You used to be an anarchist, and your answer to this question would always be nothing. And now you're throwing down all kinds of answers that go way beyond where I would go. Really? You think I've gone too far here? No, I think it all comes out the same in the wash, but I wouldn't offer the justification you have. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about something real interesting. You know how I'm kind of a science geek? 
And I've always been fascinated by the things that are out there on the cutting edge of science. I just read you the headline, damaged liver repaired inside machine for three days before transplant. There's a game changer for you. Imagine if we could repair livers. All kinds of people would benefit from this. This is not a transplant. This is the guy's own liver? No, it's a transplant. They opened up the transplant. They said, oh, my God, it's damaged. They put it in some kind of machinery, and it came out fine three days later, at which point they put it into the man who needed it, and that happened one year ago, and he's fine. Right. But by extension, if you're the guy with the damaged liver, take it out, put you on some sort of machine, repair the thing, three days later, you get your own liver back. Well, let's not go crazy here. I I, I don't know if that's a possibility (laughs) or not. One human being got a liver that he had no business getting. It was damaged. They were going to toss it. And he's alive right now, a year later, because somebody found out something that works. This brings me to the foolishness of the week. Missing in action, lo, these weeks that you have been walking through Europe like a fool. Actually, you were kind of like a donkey. <laughs> just, there are a lot of similarities there, James. <laughs> that's, that's right. Just going from one from one end to the other, slowly making horrible noises as you go. Carrying a this pack on you. my back. Right. Probably getting yelled at by everybody around you most of the time. Not understanding um, any of it. <laughs> yeah, but it's nice to feel the return of the foolishness of the week. And where to go, Ant, in our quest, but back to beautiful, sunny California. Because... California is unveiling its groundbreaking slave reparations report. Report? What are they saying? Well, the report says that you have to give reparations. What else would you expect the report to say? Of course, that's what it says. Does it give a number? It gives all kinds of numbers. It's hard to make heads or tails of it. You can all read the thing if you want. It's in the links in the show notes. The thing here, and I say this often, and I never get anybody to answer my question. How is it the fault of a bunch of people who never owned slaves and they have to pay money to another group of people who were never slaves? If you made this argument, I don't know, 1870, 1890, I think you've got something there. When there is nobody left who owned a slave and there is nobody left who was a slave. No way. There's an argument to be made that your ancestors owed it to my ancestors, and because of that, you now have something that I would otherwise have had. But if you're going to make that argument, why are we stopping with American slavery? All of our ancestors were slaves at one point. I don't want to sugarcoat slavery. I've never been one to sugarcoat slavery. That was America's problem. Got solved with the 13th Amendment. It's not America's problem anymore. The fact that we've got what I call the civil rights industry digging in and churning up these waters yet again, I think what we're seeing is a group of people who understands that as long as they can keep this front and center, they'll keep making a living. That's where everything becomes a bit dicey when you realize that there are people who actually make their living on the fact that this is an issue. Often on the Foolishness of the Week, we talk about things like some idiot jumping off a building, another idiot making a rocket that he wants to shoot up off his double wide. But then there's this other kind of foolishness, right? the kind that involves people making all kinds of ridiculous claims. This is absurd. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. This week, I want to talk about something that begins with the observation that economists do themselves a great disservice in that we use terms in English to refer to technical things in economics. And one of the problems here is that it gives non-economists the false sense that they understand what we're talking about. The thing I want to talk about today, and I hesitate to even use the proper term because it's going to invoke incorrect images in people's minds. But I'll do it nonetheless, because this is what economists talk about. I want to talk about what we call consumer surplus. 
with a huge footnote here, this is not surplus in the sense that we normally think of surplus, of having more than you need. Consumer surplus refers to a phenomenon that occurs in every single transaction. And if you think about the last transaction you made where you purchased a car or a piece of music or a house or a pair of shoes or whatever it is, the following occurred. There was some price. Let's take an example. Suppose we're talking about a computer. Oh. Which you just bought one, didn't you? <laughs> well, I'm always just buying one because I keep stealing things. But I saw this thing, the early 1976 computers, I believe it was, where they show the thing and they say only fifty nine ninety nine. Right, right. That? I went and looked into what fifty nine ninety nine would be in today's dollars, and it's twenty nine thousand dollars. Right. If you're out there claiming that computers never get any cheaper, guess what? Somewhere I've got a chart that shows actual computer ads going back to nineteen seventies, and it's the ads for whatever the top of the line computer is, and it shows the price tag. If you look at this thing moving forward in time, the prices fluctuate a bit, but they're always around a thousand fifteen hundred dollars. Now, that's not adjusted for inflation. So you go back to, you know, 1980, top of the line machine, a thousand bucks. Today, top of the line machine, a thousand bucks. But the machine today is way better than the machine back in 1980. But let's take this as an example, computers. Let's suppose that the computer costs the retailer a thousand bucks to produce all in. So figure everything, labor, materials, overhead, the whole thing. Costs a thousand bucks. And you pay for this computer $1,300. Any reasonable person is going to look at that and say, okay, well, the seller walked away with a profit, profit of 300 bucks. It cost him a thousand bucks to provide the thing. And I paid $1,300 for it. And that is where people almost always stop. And they say things like, well, look at the profit that this company has made. And we add this up and we get the sense somehow that that $300 that the company got, it got at our expense. That's a healthy margin. Yeah, it is a healthy margin. And we can argue about whether it should be $300 profit or $100 profit or whatever it is. Right. But none of that addresses the topic I want to talk about. And that is what economists call consumer surplus. And here's how this works. Here's this machine. The price tag on it is $1,300. Now I ask you, what is the maximum you'd be willing to pay for that machine? And you've got to think about all kinds of things like, you know, what are you going to do with it? What are your alternatives? All this kind of thing. What are the features? But everybody's got some number in their mind. You look at the thing and we do this at a gut level. So you say, yeah, that looks like a good deal or no, it's not a good deal. And what we're really doing is comparing that number in our head that maybe we can't exactly quantify to the price tag. If the price tag sure. is less than the number in our head, we say, hey, this is a great deal. And we buy the thing. And look, I do this all the time, right? I spilled soda into my last beautiful laptop when I was on vacation in beautiful downtown Burbank, California. <laughs> Maybe we'll do bonus material on the vacations I have been forced to take. I had to go out and get a computer and I needed it right now. Okay, that adds to the price. Yeah. I can't wait for a sale. I'm a Mac guy. I look at the 14-inch MacBooks because the 16-inch that I had was a little hard to carry, you know, things like this. And don't you know, I can have lots more RAM if I want it, but Apple charges like 85 times what the market would charge you for RAM. And I get irritated now. Would I like more RAM? Sure. But I get all agitated. I think bad thoughts. And I say, screw you. I'm buying the one with just the baby amount. You know, there's a lot of questions. When do you need it? What do you need it to do? How much are you willing to pay for convenience? I buy Macs because it's convenient. They back right up in a way that I don't ever have to bother with. And before you know it, there are probably more decisions I make in the purchase of one thing than even I myself could count. And so too, everyone, and it varies, of course, we're talking about a computer and we spend lots of time thinking about it, more so about a car or a house, much less so about a pack of gum or something. And you said it was at a gut level, and I think it really is. I think yeah. any number of the questions and answers that I came up with, I wasn't exactly aware of them. They happen in the background. And what you're doing is coming up with what we call a reservation price. That's an auction term right there. Yeah, it's the absolute maximum you're willing to pay. One penny more and you walk away. Or if it's from the seller's perspective, the absolute lowest price you're willing the to take. The absolute lowest, yeah. Now, notice something interesting here. There's a symmetry and an asymmetry. The symmetry is 
what's going on on the seller side is also going on on your, the buyer side. That is, the seller says to himself, it cost me $1,000 to bring this computer to market. I'm going to try and sell it for $1,300. I'm going to walk away with a $300 profit. And you, on the buyer's side, you've got this reservation price. And for all the reasons that you described, let's suppose that the absolute maximum you'd pay for this computer is $1,600. But you don't pay $1,600. You pay $1,300. That's the price. You also walked away with a profit. The difference between the maximum you're willing to pay and what you actually paid. And here's where the asymmetry comes in. People can very clearly see that profit that the seller made because we measure it. It's right there written on paper. You paid $1,300. It cost him $1,000. That's $300 profit. And he has to report that to somebody and I can Google it and I can see it. What we can't see, but which is equally real, is that profit you made that you were willing to pay $1,600, but you only paid $1,300, and you walked away with an effective profit of $300. That's right. And there's there's really no way to measure that. There are ways that we can experimentally estimate it, right? Yeah, it would take so much to do it, but we all know this intuitively. Yeah, whether we can measure it or not, whether it's easy to measure or not, isn't the point. The point is the thing exists. You walk away with some benefit. And I think this fact that we can see the one side of the equation very clearly, what the seller benefits, and we cannot see very clearly at all the other side, but which is equally real, how much the buyer benefits. I think because of that, we tend to think that the benefit of a transaction is only on the seller's side, and that leads us to make all sorts of mistakes when we think about economics. I'll give you one of them right off that you were talking about just a moment ago, the price of health care. We talk about how the price of health care has gone up in this country and we say, what can we do to control it? And this is a serious problem. And we're only looking at half of the equation. We're looking at the profit that the health care companies make, the health insurers make. We aren't looking at the profit that the consumers make. You just talked about a machine that will repair people's livers. Right. Now, right, right. to someone who's dying of liver damage, how much is that machine worth to the person? It's worth a tremendous amount. It's worth everything he's got and everything everybody else has yeah. got. It's worth everything to him. It's worth far more than he will actually pay, even given the elevated cost of health care. I have an interesting story for you. I have a doctor who wanted me to get an MRI on my back so we could figure out exactly what's going on. I wandered in for my appointment and they said, um, okay, how will you be paying your copay? I said, well, a credit card, I guess. They said, okay, it's $1,650. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. That you just made the face and sound that I made when the lady told me that. And I said, well, I'm going to be leaving now. I wish you well. Yeah. I tell the doctor what had happened. And he said, huh. All right. Try this other place and tell them that you want to pay cash. $300 is the correct answer. The interesting question is, what's it worth to me? Yes. What is it worth to you? And Ant, I got to tell you, I have a very bad back and it causes me a lot of pain, has for decades. It wasn't worth $1,650. It's absolutely worth the $300. So somewhere in the middle of those two figures. There's your reservation price. That's right. And I could almost see it. When I think about the two options and how one's crazy and one is uncrazy, I think my reserve price was $500. I think if somebody had just told me that, I would have said, that sucks. Go ahead and do it. None of this contradicts the fact that you'd be better off with a lower price. I mean, clearly, you'd rather pay $50 than $500. You'd rather pay zero than 50 And the whole lower price business, well, that applies in the other direction as well. The healthcare company would rather charge you 500 than 30 They'd rather charge you 1500 than 500 And so the two of you come together and you have some agreement, something that works for you and for them, and you both walk away with some profit. One of my new hobbies is looking for stuff on Facebook Marketplace. I love this. Every now and then I see a special kind of crap that I want in my house. I'll send off a quick message and say, how much are you willing to take for this? I want to see what the market will bear. And, you know, I buy some things that the wife gets aggravated about. But it's fascinating to see this play out in real time because it's exactly what you're talking about. 
This causes us to misunderstand the nature of profit. We only see it on the corporate side. We don't see it on the consumer side. It also causes us to misunderstand things like wages. So you'll have people now saying things like, well, if the employer can afford to pay $20 an hour and he's only paying $15 an hour, this is a bad thing. And somehow he's ripped off the worker to the tune of five bucks an hour. Except think about it the other direction. If the worker could afford to take $12 an hour and he's actually taking 15, he's walking away with some profit as well. But again, we never see the profit on the person side. We only ever see it on the company side because that's the only side in which it's actually measured in objective numbers. On the one hand, we do have objective numbers. And on the other, we're left with anecdotes. And it's not only anecdotes, but people will have the tendency to exaggerate. If you asked me what is the maximum I'm willing to pay for a new computer because I spilled a can of Coke on mine, I'm going to say, well, the maximum I'm willing to pay is 1000 Yeah, except if I was actually sitting there with no computer and no one was willing to give me one for 1000 all of a sudden the maximum I'm willing to pay is not 1000 It's now 1500 So, okay, yeah, I'll pay 1500 And that's exactly what happened, right? I toasted the computer. I had to borrow somebody else's to see if there were any in stock in Tucson where I live. I'm in Burbank, California, quite a ways off. And the answer was no. And I thought, okay, I'm going to drive through Phoenix to get to Tucson. None in Phoenix either. The model I needed was unavailable in Arizona, but it was very available in California. I bought it there. Did I pay more? Absolutely, I did. I still would have paid probably another $400 if I had to. So the moral of the story here is as you hear people complain about companies making profits and how much they're making, we hear a number of politicians on about that right now. Keep in mind that all of that is correct, but it's only half of the picture. The consumer is also walking away with a profit. Now, sometimes it's lesser than what the company walks away with. A lot of times it's greater than what the company walks away with. But the consumer has this profit as well. We just don't measure it. And how best should people try to understand this? That's a really good question. And I think the answer is the following. If you've got a buyer and a seller and they come together and they agree, you know that both of them are better off. Now, you might not know how much better off the consumer is because we can't measure his reservation price, but you know that he's better off. So, for example, when you see the price of gas at $5 a gallon, you say this is price gouging and this is horrible. And yet there's somebody there at the pump actually buying the gas. You know that that person, although he'd rather pay three bucks a gallon, you know that the value that he's getting, his reservation price is above $5. Because if it wasn't, he wouldn't be buying. I've been thinking about gasoline quite a lot the last few days. At present, we're at about $4.50 a gallon here, which is easily the highest price for gas I've seen. People in California, I saw some photographs of the gas station signage. Some of those people are paying up to eight eight fifty dollars a gallon. Yeah. We all know that the California government mandates all kinds of things, that almost everything's more expensive in California. But my God, $8 a gallon? Would you pay it? Well, see, that's the thing. I could sit here in the comfort of my home and say, no, I wouldn't pay that. And yet, if I had to get to work and my tank was empty, you know darn well I would pay it. So the value to me is more than $8 a gallon. Probably a lot more, given that you would be fired if you didn't go to work. Right, <laughs> right, and yes. I have no idea what my reserve price for a gallon of gas is. I know what my reserve price for a car is. It's $40,000. I'd never pay more than that. That's interesting. That never occurred to me to just mention it. I'm the same. I have no idea what my reservation price for gas is, but I'm pretty sure what it is for a car. Let me tie back to the beginning because I said a term that I have left out there hanging, and that is consumer surplus. Yeah, that's right. What the hell is that? Consumer surplus is to the consumer what profit is to the producer. Now, economists are going to take issue with me because what I just said was technically incorrect. But for non-economists, you can think of it like that. The consumer surplus is the difference between what I would have paid and what I actually paid. Which sounds so beautifully simple. Yeah. And then there's nothing but a god-awful mess when you try to quantify it in any way. And yet, keep in the back of your mind, the fact that this thing exists indicates that people who exchange voluntarily are better off by definition. 
when we started working together, I really didn't have much of a handle on what we were going to do because it was my belief that there was a lot of economics that I was just never going to understand. But at the core of economics, what you have is philosophy and psychology. Right. And those two things I understand quite well. There are ways to pry the cover off and look at the stuff that is economics, even if you're not in the business of making a big, long equation. The most interesting parts of economics don't contain those at all. That's exactly right. The most interesting parts don't. They're accessible to everybody. I got home after we were on the road, and I went to the fridge to grab a soda, and there weren't any. And I said, where's the soda? And the wife looked at me and said, it's not on sale. We can't have it. I think you and she have different reservation prices for soda. <laughs> Don't we ever? Because I looked and said, well, how many jobs do I have to have before we'll just pay full price on the soda? <laughs> and she looked at me, shook her head and just said, it wasn't on sale. <laughs> no soda for you, James. That is correct. And we do have, without question, different reserve prices. Why? Because I love soda. She doesn't. Therein lies an entirely different episode that we should talk about at some point. What happens when the person who has to live with the consequences of the purchase, that's you, is not the person who's making the choice, which is your wife. And all of a sudden, in situations like that, and there are lots of situations like that, you end up with solutions in which people are not better off. Little known fact, I love ice cream. I thought about this just last week because I'm driving down the road. There is no ice cream at the house. I know this. I'm passing all kinds of supermarkets, and I know that they all have ice cream cakes. And I love ice cream cake every bit as much as I love regular ice cream. And I thought, what would I spend for an ice cream cake? But I figured at the time that the answer was going to be about $20. And I got home. I opened up the computer. I got online. Don't you know, sixteen ninety nine. There you go. 17 bucks. You walked away $3 better off after spending your $17. And with an ice cream cake. Right. This is my plan for later on today. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> so that's all we've got this week on Words and Numbers. I'll let you know next week whether I ever got that ice cream cake. In the meantime, you can follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. You can. You can send us email. Words and Numbers podcast at gmail.com. Somebody has taken issue with one or more of our episodes and signed me up to every possible Donald Trump support site that exists out there. I got just yesterday 15 separate emails saying, thank you for your interest in donating to Donald Trump. <laughs> Aunt, you brought this on yourself. <laughs> the sad thing is, is you brought it on me, too. And for God's sake, people, I know it's getting hot. When it gets hot, people get testy, and when people get testy, they become very unkind. Don't do it. Give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Nobody wants stupid things. You might disagree with how they want to get where they want to get, but you kind of want to get to the same place, too. So let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt for a week, and let's just try to be nice. Be nice to each other. And it's good seeing you again. See you next week, James. James.